Welcome back to Thomas Tessier's World of Hurt. I'm Chris L. McKenna. Today's episode was first published in a magazine called Horror Garage in 2000, edited by Paula Garan. It's a story of a young man and a fortune teller, and it's entitled The Ventriloquist. See if you can tell me why you think Mr. Tessier named it that. Enjoy The Ventriloquist. Robbie had heard about this woman, Anne Marie. Nobody knew her last name. She could see things. She could tell you things about yourself that you didn't know. Something good or bad may be coming your way. He had heard all kinds of talk about her, at least since back in his freshman year at the high school. It was a small city. People get to know. He knew some who'd gone to visit her. Girls who thought she was for real and kind of scary. She knew right away that my grandmother was in the hospital, they'd say. That my brother was in a car crash. That I was pregnant. Yeah, that kind of stuff. Guys who laughed it off as a joke or who hinted that if you paid extra, the woman would do a lot more than just read your cards. His grandparents were a bit superstitious that way. His mother, too, though less so. Robbie had never really given it much thought. Probably, he would say, he didn't believe in it. But here he was, 21 years old, on his way to see the woman. <sighs> Scraping the bottom of the barrel for a glimmer of hope. You know, that showed better than anything else ever could, how thoroughly screwed up he was by Susie Schneider. He resented it, bitterly. But now he knew what it was like to feel like you have to try anything. Robbie knew that Anne-Marie lived in a trailer park in the northern edge of town out on the old turnpike that used to be the main thoroughfare up and down the Brass Valley. There wasn't much traffic on it anymore, since they put Route 8 through on the other side of the river a few years ago. Many of the businesses had subsequently relocated. A scattering of them remained, but the pike was a half-forgotten back road now. Cedar Glen was about half a mile past the shooting range. Robbie slowed down and swung his 59 fair lane onto a dirt road that wound slowly through the trees. Most of the trailers were old and on the small side, round like snail shells, relics from the 30s and 40s. They showed their age, too, with stains, faded paint, and patches of rust. There were potted flowers, lawn chairs, barbecue grills, folding tables, and other small signs of lingering effort. But overall, it struck Robbie as the kind of place where people end up when they have nowhere else left to go. Most of the ones he saw, and they scarcely even glanced at him as he passed by, looked as if they were at the back end of middle age or older. Not a kid in sight. The road meandered and looped around, but it always came back to the main stem, and the place wasn't that big anyway. It was hemmed in by the rising valley walls and the pike along the Nogatuck River. Robbie had checked with a friend, and he knew more or less where he was going and what he was looking for. Just beyond the communal picnic area, itself a sad joke, the road curled over a small rise and then down into a lower flat area, where the trees were thinner and the sun penetrated. Hers was the newer trailer, parked alongside a narrow stream. It was long, intended to look like a ranch house, but with a flat roof. Powder blue and white, with a couple of sporty diagonal yellow bars up near the front end. What clinched it were the two cars parked nearby. The beat-up Impala with the Connecticut plates would be hers, and the shiny new Cadillac with the New York plates belonged to some other fool who thought that the woman could tell him something important. Robbie pulled in, turned his engine off, lit a lucky, and waited. It was a beautiful afternoon, the air sweet and mild. Yeah, it wasn't bad down here, where she was. But he couldn't imagine living in one of those boxy things. Though, to be fair, the rooms he shared with his mother and kid sister on the ground floor of an old triple-decker seemed cramped enough. <sighs> he had to get out, find a place for himself. He was working on that but it took time to put the money together. Meanwhile, the days dribble away like piss on a bad morning. He could feel the anger smoldering and sparking up within him. It was September 17, 1969, exactly 34 days since he'd last seen Susie face to face, and 17 since she'd changed her number to an unlisted number. Oh, <laughs> uh, Susie had some bitch in her, all right. He was getting to the end of his second cigarette when a colorfully dressed hippie couple emerged from the trailer. 
expensive boutique shit. In the music business, Robbie figured, they hopped into the caddy and roared off with a spray of dust and gravel. A chunky woman with steel-gray hair opened the door even before Robbie could knock. He had to pay $25. Then she steered him into a small room off to the right, the shorter end of the long trailer, and told him that Anne Marie would be with him in a couple of minutes. Twenty-five was kind of steep, he thought. But he hadn't objected to it. If they could charge that and get it, she must be pretty good after all. Robbie sat on one of the three plain wooden chairs that were arranged around a small circular table with a maroon velvet cloth. Dark blue curtains covered the windows, and light was provided by a trio of wall fixtures with parchment-like shades that gave the room a pleasingly warm golden glow. There wasn't much else. A soft, thick carpet that matched the curtains, and a wicker wastebasket off in the corner. The lack of atmospheric touches was mildly disappointing, but on the other hand, maybe it simply meant that she didn't need to rely on typical fortune teller props. The door opened, and Anne Marie entered the room. Robbie stood up and nodded awkwardly at her. She had dark hair that extended below her shoulder, a slim figure, powerful eyes, and a narrow face and she was wearing a thin gray caftan that hung loosely on her body. Thirty-ish and still pretty, but she looked tired, very tired, and sad. She had some small object in her hand. She hesitated for a moment as she stared at him, her eyes widening slightly, her lips tightening. Why have you come here? I was hoping you could help me. Her body seemed to sag a little as she sighed. Her expression now was almost sorrowful, but she gestured for Robbie to sit down and she took the chair directly across the table from him. She handed him a new deck of ordinary playing cards, still wrapped in cellophane. Open it, take out the jokers, and shuffle the cards several times. Take your time, do a good job of touching and mixing them, and while you're doing that, I want you to think about the reason you came here, the person or situation that most concerns you. Robbie did as he was told. As a kid, he had learned how to make the cards flutter and whir perfectly when he shuffled, and he was pleased to see that he still had that ability, though he hadn't actually played cards in quite a while. He concentrated on Susie. How they had known each other for years, living in the same neighborhood and going to the same schools. How their romance had come as an astonishing surprise to both of them, overpowering them late in their junior year. And then how right it seemed. How very right and good, and what a fine, happy couple they made. Going steady, going out and doing things together, their passions and dreams. That's fine. Now I want you to deal three cards face down. The next card also goes face down, but to one side. Then keep on dealing the whole deck into those two groups, three in one pile, then one in the other, and so on. Robbie's fingers moved swiftly and the cards fell. Not long after high school, the trouble began. Small stuff at first. Just a hint now and then. A pout, a, a look of dissatisfaction. Susie worked full-time at the perfume counter at G. Fox. Robbie worked for Ray Palumbo, who had his own nursery and landscape business. It was hard, sweaty work, but Robbie liked it. He liked working outdoors. If you owned your own business and built it up like Ray had done, you could earn a pretty good living doing something you enjoyed. That's what Robbie had in mind for himself, down the road. Anne-Marie took the pile of thirteen cards and held them tightly in her hands. She had Robbie reshuffle the rest of the deck and then separate them again, this time putting two in one pile and one aside, and continuing in that way. Susie moved into an apartment with a couple of girlfriends. It wasn't always comfortable to spend time with her there, the others hanging around, coming and going. He suspected that they were telling Susie he wasn't good enough for her. He sensed that she didn't enjoy being with him as much as she had. That he was losing her. And it ate him up inside. Never had he felt so helpless, bewildered, and incapable of writing things. Then it turned into a soap opera. The evening she wasn't home when he called, and one of her roommates was a little too curt. Somehow it told Robbie that he was finished, only Susie hadn't gotten around to telling him yet. He went out with Ray's nephew, Teddy. They hit a few bars in town and ended up later at the music box out on Bantam Lake. Susie was there, with Artie Huff. 
Couldn't get a date in high school, but now Artie was a college boy. A prick with better prospects, apparently. By then, Robbie was buzzed enough to make a scene, and that really was the end of it. The next day, it sunk in, and he cried. Then the desperate attempts to see her, to speak with her, just once more. Nothing worked, and the hurt didn't let go. It only seemed to get worse, festering with anger. Anne-Marie took the second group of thirteen cards and held them for a moment, before setting them down on the table in front of her with the first group. She had Robbie divide the cards into two groups of thirteen, and again she took the discards. Now she directed him to lay out the final thirteen cards he held in this way. One card face down, five cards face up, another card face down horizontally in front of him. A second line of five cards face up, directly above the first, the last card face down at the top forming a triangle with the other two cards that were facing down. The other ten cards were a mix of numbers and suits, with a queen of clubs, an ace of diamonds, and a king of hearts in the mix. It seemed pretty ridiculous to Robbie. A meaningless rigmarole, cooked up to look mysterious and impressive. Anne-Marie stared at the cards for a couple of minutes, and then she looked up at Robbie. There are three things you want. He was confused. All he wanted was to get Susie back, or at least to know if he ever would. No, I... Don't tell me. If you think about it, you'll find that what you want presents two other possibilities, depending on whether or not it is fulfilled. Huh. She was right. Almost. Two other thoughts did immediately come to mind, when she put it like that. Okay. These cards are very favorable. Anne-Marie told him, waving her hand over the ten cards that were facing up. Two threes and two nines, that's very good. The King of Hearts represents you. The Queen of Clubs is the one you want. Isn't that so? Yeah, that's right. Robbie found himself replying. Who's the Ace of Diamonds? Thinking it might be Artie Huff. Anne-Marie's fingers waved dismissively. It only means you're good at what you do, your talents, your work. Oh. Robbie felt vaguely pleased. There are no indications of internal conflict. You're not hesitant or doubtful. You're certain within yourself of what you want in this situation. Isn't that so? Yeah, definitely. All right. What you want most is always at your left hand. Touch the card there with your fingertips, the one facing down. Robbie did so. Anne-Marie then reached forward, took the card, and pulled it gently out from under his fingers. She turned it over for him to see. It was a dinky little four of diamonds. It can't hurt, he thought. You're completely stopped. I'm sorry. What? Stopped? What's that mean? You'll never have her. The four is completely disruptive of your numbers. It's impossible. Robbie exhaled slowly. He thought he was beginning to catch on to some of this. The numbers didn't work. And maybe the fact that the four was a diamond referred to Artie having better career prospects. It was hard to take, but it made sense. Now, focus on your second thought. Touch the card facing down on your right. Whatever else happens, don't let Artie have her. Not that little jerk. Robbie pressed his fingertips to the card and held them there. Anne-Marie reached across the table again and carefully took the card, turning it over in the air. A six of spades. The number is yours. There is no resistance but the outcome is not necessarily conclusive. What's that mean? It means that what you wish in this circumstance will most likely come to pass, but it won't resolve the matter. In spite of what many people think, spades are the most ambiguous suit. This was more like it. This was the kind of thing he wanted to hear, and yet it wasn't quite good enough. So... You have one more thought. He sure did. He wanted Susie to feel the pain he had felt. To know what it was like to see everything come crashing down and, and yet not be able to do anything to stop it. A current of anger hummed and buzzed within. Robbie put his fingers on the card facing down at the top of the triangle. Anne-Marie removed it and turned it over. The Jack of Spades. She gazed at him, her eyes giving nothing away. What's it mean, Jack of Spades? What you want is unopposed. You mean it'll happen? Nothing external prevents it. And what does that mean, exactly? If you truly want it to happen... Well, I do. 
then it will. What about it's a spade? What's that mean? Uncertainty. When, where, how. Things like that. And what about... Thank you for coming to see me. Robbie was still thinking about it five weeks later. What a crock. He might have known. It was kind of spooky the way she got some things right. But that was part of the act. She knew how to carry it off. Only later, when you get out from under the spell, could you see it for what it was. First off, Emery told Robbie he would never have Susie. But the very next day, Susie spoke to him on the phone when he called. It was kind of cool. No breakthrough, but it was a step in the right direction. And it seemed to him that she sounded almost unhappy. They talked a couple more times on the phone. But then Susie cut him off again. He started following her and discovered that she and Artie liked to go to Vito's Steak and Seafood in Torrington. Sneaky. A little out of the way. Popular, judging by the cars in the lot. Two weeks and more. She talked, always vague, uncertain. But at the same time, Artie wasn't going away. Artie Huff was still the man. And whenever Robbie saw her with him, she looked like she was truly enjoying herself. The bitch. She felt like broken glass in Robbie's bowels. The proof that Susie was just stringing him along, playing with him, came when she lost interest in the game. She stopped taking his calls again. And this time, he knew at once that it was final. It was a rainy Saturday evening in November, the last time Robbie followed them up Route 8. Vito's, of course. Why else would you drive to Torrington? The temperature was in the 30s, not quite freezing, and the road was slick. Just north of Thomaston, near the Northfield exit, the road passed over a deep ravine and stream. The drop had to be a hundred feet or more. Robbie hadn't even thought about it, but when he saw it coming, he sped up and pulled alongside Artie's car. They looked at him, both of them. He saw the blank look on their faces. They saw him, but they didn't get it. None of it. Not at all. Robbie swung the wheel and loved the contact. Artie's car bounced and then flew directly into the steel overhead. He caught a glimpse of the wreck in the mirror as his car spun across the road. Artie wouldn't have her. Susie had seen her own end coming and must have felt the same great anguish he knew. Robbie's car plowed through the wooden posts on the other side of the highway just beyond the main overpass and then dropped off, tumbling down into the ravine. He didn't mind at all. The End Guest starring Kelly Hooper and Adam Reeves Music by Jordan Peer This has been a Watertown Arts production.